right, so, uh, so welcome all of you. I really appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, I'm not just running off and already starting to make your game without my talk first. Uh, so my, like, uh, as well said, my name is uh, Mandir Hare, uh, and I thought it was talk Dr. Game Love or how I learned to stop worrying and embrace the fail because I'm pretty much really unoriginal. And, uh, you know, but hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll show you what I mean by embracing failure. So first let me tell you how awesome Copenhagen is. Um, <laughs> first time ever in Denmark. Uh, my friend Doug yesterday was here, showed me all around the beautiful city. Uh, I'm going to explore it more tomorrow <laughs> over, over the weekend. Uh, if you have any suggestions of places I should go visit and stuff, please come by me later and please tell me. I'd love to check out more of the city. But back to the Nordic Game Jam instead of me really looking like an idiot. Uh, so apparently about 300 people are going to take part in this game jam, making it the largest game jam in the world. Uh, there doesn't actually seem to be a Guinness World Record for the largest game jam on the books, but I think that that should be something that this game jam should shoot for in the future, like to get the Guinness guys out here and officially recognize this event as the largest one in the world. Now, enough silly records. What do you, I know what you're thinking. Who is this homeless man standing in front of you asking you about like, how to record the prototype? Well, I promise you I'm not actually homeless, even though my beard says otherwise. I'm actually a designer, so a quick little bit about me. I worked on a couple of games at Raven Software uh, a few years ago called like, Wolfenstein and Singularity, which I'm fairly sure nobody played because I saw our sales figures. Uh, <laughs> more recently, I uh, just f finished kind of what was my work on Mass Effect 3. And so actually the homeless man beard is my beta beard. A bunch of us are not shaving until the game is done. We're days away from being done, but we're not quite there. So uh, what I also hear is if you stroke it, you get three wishes. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, this game jam. Let's talk about the history first of this game jam. Like, how did we get here? Uh, the Global Game Jam Initiative, the Nordic Game Jam. Well, let's take a trip back in time to 2001. Uh, back in 2001, two developers, Chris Hacker, who was pictured here, and Sean Barrett, started a discussion one day about how, uh, simply about how many guys could they render on screen with modern graphics hardware. They were feeling that you know games were basically topping out at about a thousand uh, guys on screen, and they thought they could do a way better job than that. Uh, and so after some tests and like you know testing it all out, they discovered that they could get about a hundred thousand visible sprites on screen at a reasonable frame rate on get this a less than one gigahertz machine with a GeForce 2. <laughs> if you remember that old stuff. And so. Once they rendered all of these 100,000 creatures on the screen, as Hacker put it, quote, a ton of wacky game ideas instantly popped into our heads. And we told other game designer programmer friends about it, and they too had zillions of wacky game ideas. And thus the concept for the zeroth annual indie game jam was born. The concept was very simple. A group of creative game programmers and designers would meet, use an already written game engine, and see what they could create. Participants were formed as free to form teams, do multiple games, and work on pretty much anything they wanted. But first, they needed an engine. And so over a weekend, uh, Hecker and Barrett, along with Doug Church, Jonathan Blow, and Casey Muratori, all got together and kind of wrote the game engine for the Zero Game Jam. And then they needed a test case, you know, for the game. So Church ended up writing a game called Angry God Bowling which you can see here. This is actually uh, about 80,000 guys on screen, not the 100,000 promised, by the way. Uh, and if you can't tell, the sprite they use is the demon from Doom, also lovingly known as Pinky. Uh, so in the summary of the invitation email that Hacker sent out to his friends, it said, you are cordially invited to the zeroth annual indie game jam. 100,000 guys, or quantity, has a quality all its own. Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Come design something weird and new and fun and creative and in a fun and creative collaborative environment. Who knows what people will come up with? If this year works out, we'll do a new jam every year with a new wacky technology every time. And so on the Ides of March in 2002, in Oakland, California, 14 game developers gathered together and created what is considered to be the birth of the game jam at Indie Game Jam Zero. In the end, they created 12 experimental, innovative games in just four days. There was a huge army version of the children's playground game, Red Rover, uh, that was made. This game was called Firefighter, where you uh, fight forest fires in a helicopter, you have to go pick up water and then drop it off. 
Uh, this game of worship is described as, quote, a missile command style game with hordes of demons that are trying to, trying to capture instantiations of Jesus. <laughs> Crucify them and then take them away while you're trying to protect them. <laughs> Possibly the greatest line of code in history of video games. Define max price. <laughs> I challenge you to find a better line of code ever written for a game. Uh, Super RTS was created called Total Age of Doomcraft and Conquer Romero. Right? Uh, this game, it was just spawned all over the place automatically. They were skewed out. You didn't have to do a build order like you do in normal real time strategy games. And then there was a, this game here called Dueling Machine, uh, which is more like a first person shooter as you can see, except you had exactly one bullet and you had to kill a single unique fugitive amongst these thousands of people. And they actually got networking working uh, at the game jam as well. So clearly, like, and there were more games than this, so the Zerk in the game jam was a very rousing success for these guys. And following the success of this event in late February 2003, a year later, Indie Game Jam One occurred. And this time, a few more developers, 17 developers, gathered again in Oakland for four days of experimentation. But they needed a different engine this time. So the engine that they used? A unique game engine called Shadow Garden by Zach Simpson. Shadow Garden utilized a projector, screen, camera, and a computer, and hooked it all up to let the program interact in interesting ways with the shadow projected on the screen. A bunch of interesting games, as you can imagine, emerged from this technology. An updated version of Paul was created that used force fields emanating from your shadow. As you can see, the shadows make up the paddles and affect the ball depending on the shape they pose in. A game called Supermodel Shootout was created where you would pose and then the shadow was captured and the other person would have to match that pose and it would kind of rapidly go back and forth until, as, it, as they said, basically it became a crazy jumping contest. Um, an owl simulator was designed where you flew around like an owl. Uh, like this is the Kinect before the Kinect was made, people. Like this is awesome. And a Hungry Hungry Hackers was a game where you bounce food items into different game jammers' mouths. Uh, and then there was an indie game jam two the following year, 2004, where there were more developers working on a physics-based game this time, and this is one of the examples of one of those games. But clearly, this group of guys uh, and girls was onto with something in the buzz. They had following. They were doing something interesting. And by 2005, there were game jams happening around the world, including in Lithuania, and Toronto, and Dallas, and Boston. And of course, right here at the Nordic Game Jam, which found a home in Copenhagen in 2006. Now, the Nordic Game Jam decided to grow in size you know, each year because of the popularity of, of the event. This growth continued through 2009, when the first global game jam was organized by the IGDA. The idea of this being all these different sites around the world, as you know, would do a game jam at the same time. There were 53 locations worldwide for the first ever global game jam. Approximately 1,650 participants created 370 games. To see how much the global game jam has grown in like two or three short years, last year there's 169 sites, 6,500 participants, making over 1,500 games worldwide. That's over triple the participation of the first global game jam. And this year, everyone expects this to be even bigger than ever. And you all are a good big reason for that. The key to the game jams wasn't just that there was a theme that people were following, but rather that the participants were interested in encouraging experimentation and innovation in an industry that is at a time of risk adverse. That push against risk adverseness, to me, is what makes these game jams very special. It's the initial point of that. And so I say to all of you, uh, don't forget that initial intent when you're working on your games this weekend. Have fun, make something that you want to make, but don't be scared to try something weird, different, innovative, and new. Most importantly, don't be scared to fail. Embrace failure. Because of a game jam, failure is still something worth holding up. Failure is something ta worth talking about. The only true way for you to fail at a game jam is to create something and then come out with literally no lessons, nothing, no knowledge known, nothing that you can ever apply to the craft of game development the rest of the time. And if you can pull that one off, I applaud you for being magical. Um, <laughs> failure is a learning mechanism, right? A way of teaching yourself something. More importantly, it's a document about your attempt. 
It's something for you to look back on, see what you did wrong and right, and adjust for the future. And sometimes that attempt to do something crazy and different will turn out something, something magical. So here's one story about that. In the spring of 2005, a group of four graduate students at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania's Entertainment Technology Center locked themselves in a room for a semester, not the entire semester, but mostly locked in. Uh, and they wanted to start discovering and rapidly prototyping as many new forms of gameplay as possible. They had three rules. Rule number one, each game must be made in less than seven days. Rule number two, each game must be made by exactly one person, not two people, not zero people, one. And uh, rule number three, each game must be based around a common theme, such as gravity, vegetation, swarms. And so the guys begin prototyping. One of the students, Cal Gabler, spent seven days prototyping a new game during this time period called Tower of Goo. In Tower of Goo, the player had to, quote, drag trash-talking gods of goo to build a giant tower high and higher. The game would be a battle against not opponents, but gravity, right? If you build an unstable tower, all your hard work would collapse upon itself, forcing you to start all over and probably cry. The end, at the end of this game, when it was done, it became a pretty interesting and fun, and so it was released onto the internet. And in the first month, Tower of Goo was downloaded over 100,000 times. It's an instant hit amongst gamers. Even the media caught onto the buzz, and this is a time uh, that the indie games were still getting a lot of coverage in the media. Gabler and his new partner, Ron Carmel, formed a company known as 2D Boy. And after failing to turn a few concepts into full games, they revisited the Tower of Goo concept. They decided to make the game bigger with more goo balls. Yes, that is the official name of the objects in the game. And they decided to call the game World of Goo. World of Goo went on to be released in the fall of 2008, won numerous awards, including the Seamus McNally Grand Prize at the Independent Games Festival and sold well over a million copies. Like, it's a bona fide indie hit, a true story of success and triumph through uh, innovation and experimentation. This is our history of game jams, and it's part of our video game history. This history is being written as we speak across the globe. This is why you are all sitting here. It's not only to have fun and be creative, but to see if you can generate something special. The next idea that can generate the next full game would be a hit to push yourself and try to uh, experiment and be innovative. The games you generate today, tomorrow, the next day are gonna be contributing to this history. And it's possible one of you will generate a game so interesting, so, so special, that years from now when someone's recounting the history of game jams, they include talking about that. And that's exciting and unique to game jams. There's no other place you could possibly be that will generate this number of ideas this fast. And that's why I'm so excited to be here, not only to speak to you, but to get to look at what you guys have all uh, made on Sunday and judge. And I hope you're excited for this as well. But the issue is, between now and then, there's a whole lot of hard work ahead of you. So I want to talk to you guys about embracing failure and how to rapidly prototype to help you be as successful as possible. The power of game jams and the quick iteration loop is that if ideas do not work out, you haven't wasted months or years of your life on them, right? It lets you try out lots of different things in a short period of time. It, and sometimes with Tower of Goo, you hit something magical along the way, and that can be expanded into a full product. But these sorts of things don't happen by luck. Yes, there is absolutely some luck involved, but there's also the smart approach, the smart way to rapidly prototype new ideas and give them the best chance at uh, succeeding. And I want to spend some time talking about this rapid prototyping. Because to me, that is the best way to succeed, not only in a game jam, but in general game development, no matter what your team size. So why rapidly prototype? Well, that, answer, that can be best answered with pottery. Yes, pottery. <laughs> so in a book, Art of Fear, uh, by David Bales and Ted Harlan, a story is recounted. So some of you probably heard this story. A ceramics teacher announced on the first day of class that he's going to divide the class into two halves. He's going to grade one half of the class solely on the quality of one single pot that they generate at the end of the semester. The other half of the class is going to be graded solely on the quantity by mass of pots generated by semester. At the end of the semester, the professor put all the pots, put them all over, and he noticed something. The quality of the pots in the quantity group 
was up higher than it would then the, the group that made one single pot. Why is this? Well, it's because of the iteration loop of design. While the first half was bogged down in all those little details of how to make the perfect pot, the theory of pots, the Wikipedia pots, the second group was just fucking making pots. <laughs> like, they were making pots fast and lots of them. Um, and once they made the first crappy pot, they made the second less crappy pot. And they kept you know, doing this over and over and learning from their mistakes. And they continued this till their end product pots, or the last set of pots that they were making, were significantly higher quality than anyone else's pots. And this is the same sort of result you get from rapid prototyping in video games. If you were someone who's trying to learn how to make video games, this is a great way to start out and finish, like start and finish something fast. It's better for you to make six games in six months or even six weeks if you can. Uh, you're going to learn so much more from making a game, even bad games, right? It'll teach you how to come up with games as well as how to finish and all the problems with scope and all that, and you're going to really hit. From there, you can start coming up with new and more interesting ideas once you know the basics. If you already make games on the side or for a living frequently, rapid prototyping helps you make decisions faster. And I'm going to argue, makes helps you make decisions better than any design document ever could in the world. It helps let you start playing with the nuts and the bolts of what you were trying to build. It'll let you learn from your mistakes and it'll just it gives you the ability to scrap something early and start over and try something new, or just, just make incremental improvements and adjustments. Rapid prototyping is the key to making great games, not just at game jams, anywhere. Let me take a quick aside to address design documents, since I just mentioned them. Uh, in my opinion, large design documents are the most overblown, unnecessary waste of time and space that plagues designers and industry people and studios ever. I remember working on a project a few years ago as a lead designer. Uh, it was a major game, and I needed to get a design document for the whole game together. And so my, the design group and myself got about a 15-page design doc together. We explained all the high-level goals of the game. We gave like the feel. We gave some ideas of how we were going to implement it. But we didn't go as far as going, it's going to work exactly like this and give every little detail. We created an outline, not a blueprint. And so eventually, you know, a design doc, that design doc went to the publisher, the publisher came back and was like, this isn't enough detail. Like, I can't fund the game off of this. I need a hundred page, like, you know, design doc. And I'm like, that seems like a waste. And after fighting, I lost and had to create a hundred design, a hundred page design doc with people. So what did I do to create a hundred page design doc? Well, first I put a whole lot of fucking pictures in there. Uh, <laughs> pictures are awesome at taking up space. Like, like lots of pictures, get concept art. We would take screen captures from movies and little things like that to just be like, uh, aesthetically we want to be like this. Yeah, they weren't these pictures, but you get the point. Um, what else did we put into this design doc? Well, a whole lot of bullshit. Uh, we just made up stuff basically to pad out the document and try to waste as little time producing it, right? Because I knew this wasn't going to be valuable for us. No, why did I do that? You know, once I was being forced to write the design doc, why did I still like fill it with bullshit instead of going down and figuring out the details and writing it down to appease the people? Well. It's because any seasoned designer will tell you that the quality comes from the trying, the failing, and the iterating. You never get it right the first time. Like trying to think of every little detail beforehand, document to make it perfect, and then implement is going to leave you with precious little time to fix it when it doesn't work, because most ideas fail to work. It's like trying to build one perfect pot. And it's way better to build a dozen quick pots, similar on your feet, see how they feel, and dump the ones that don't work. And so to me, design documents, they're good for high level design. They're good for the outline and a history of decisions made. They're good for directing people and giving people an idea of what's going on. They're good for QA, so they know what are bugs and what aren't bugs, so that things working as design later in the project. But they're not good when you're trying to use the design doc to design the entire game up front. If you can design an entire game through a document up front, execute that document, and it's awesome that first time around. You're the most amazing game designer of all time, and please work with me in teaching your crazy voodoo skills. <laughs> so enough about design documents. So back to making games and rapidly prototyping. So here in the game gym, you've got about 48 hours to quickly make a game. Uh, so let's talk about things that you can do, practical things you can do to build good games quickly. The first is all the pre-production phase. So first, have a small, nimble team that works well with one another. 
This is actually probably too many people for a team. Uh, now is not the best time to find out that your best friend is a lazy asshole who doesn't actually do any work and just tell people what to do and that's what you have to do. Um, make sure each team member knows what their role is and what they're doing contributing to the end product. You don't need a producer or a manager who doesn't actually build anything hands-on, right? You can share that responsibility with yourself. You can put one person to help take on some part of that responsibility while they're building. Um, but make sure you know who is doing what on your team. Make sure you know who's handling the art, the sound, the programming, the level building if you have levels. Um, you're going to have to multitask most likely, and when it gets down to the data process, this will help you identify uh, all those responsibilities, and it's going to help to make sure that everyone knows what they should be doing. And also make sure, like, no one goes, oh crap, who's doing the sound, like, an hour before the games are uh, due, right? It's just things don't fall through the cracks when you know what your uh, responsibilities are. Once you have your team assembled and your roles figured out, the most important part of making a good game comes. That's right, figuring out an awesome teammate. Uh, a good name is essential to any good game. I recommend spending about six to eight hours on a team name. Uh, I need the name, you know, focus test it with other groups for praying, stickiness. Uh, research it on the internet. You don't want a name that's ever been used before because that will completely doom your game to failure. Some tips for coming up with awesome names. Tip number one, take a well-known name and just change one of the words. Team names like electronic farts? Awesome. <laughs> what do you guys take that's free? Uh, number two, when in doubt, be vulgar. Vulgarities are always funniest, but only when you slip them in subtly, right? You gotta do something very subtle, like Mighty Morphin Fucking Rangers. Uh, and tip number three, when in doubt, make fun of the other teams as moms. Uh, like, team nine, team names of your mom is on the team, like, they will frighten and scare the other participants, leaving you victorious before you've ever written a line of code. So now that you have your team name, we get to the idea part. Now this is where most of you are going to get into trouble. In fact, this is where most large companies get into trouble. Yeah. The thing about ideas are they are cheap. There are lots of them. And for the most part, they aren't the most important thing. In normal game development, it's the execution of these ideas that matters. There's a reason there are good first-person shooters, and there's bad first-person shooters. But in a game jam, is that still true? Well, yes and no. The execution absolutely is going to matter the most. You can have the coolest idea, but if you can't pull it off reasonably, your game is going to suffer and no one's going to understand it. <clears throat> but sometimes, in a game jam setting, the initial idea can have enough momentum to make up for the rough parts of your game. After all, there is pretty much no way any of you are going to like, put out a polished game at the end of this, right? So something, sometimes just the uniqueness and promise of an idea can be enough to carry you forward. So when coming up with ideas, the best thing to do is let your imagination run wild, right? Uh, after all, unlike the mainstream industry, you're not you know, being forced to make a modern shooter or another social game that ends in the middle. But <laughs> there's a problem with that, right? There's a problem with unconstrained creativity. It's actually a lot harder for people to handle. Constraints in design, not just in game jams, anywhere in design, are good. They focus you. They make you think about the core concept. And they get rid of those thousands of ideas that you would otherwise spend time thinking about. And that's the key. You don't want, it, you don't want or need the perfect idea here. You just need a good idea. You want to generate a good idea fairly fast. Like If you can pull that one off in the first hour, you're probably in decent shape. Um, to create some constraints, the game jam organizers have already helped you. After my talk, right, there's going to be an announcement uh, regarding constraints and practicalities. You're going to have to incorporate some elements or themes into your game. Um, but I suggest go even further than that. Make further constraints amongst yourselves if you can. Think about other themes that might focus your group. Some ideas for themes are gravity, flying, sound, velociraptors. <laughs> These sorts of themes will let you whittle down your initial ideas, or better ideas, and create something that everyone is on board with, and let you focus fast. Also, fun fact, there has never been a bad game made about velociraptors in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, at this stage, make sure you know what emotions you want to evoke from the player. You want, you know, you want to might actually do this before you come with the idea or while you're doing it on the original idea. Do you want the player to just have fun? Do you want the player to feel somber and reflective? Do you want the player to feel frantic and stressed? What are the overall goals of the theme? And what are the game overall goals of the game supposed to be? 
that, along with the other constraints that you have, will start focusing your ideas and your brainstorming. Also, think about answering the questions of what does the player do? How does the game dynamically react to those inputs? And what is the goal? Make sure the answers have those mechanics and dynamics that match the emotions you want to evoke in the player. You don't want to make a game about serenity that requires the player to button match for a half hour. <laughs> One thing I'll advocate during this brainstorm of initial ideas is uh, really the airing of what I call your stupid ideas. We all have stupid ideas. I'm full of them. There are ideas that we think about, sound cool for a second, and then we kind of realize in our own head, this isn't going to work, like we shouldn't talk about this. I don't even want to say this to anybody because they're going to think I'm stupid. Um, but as a result, because we never say it to anybody, you know, something actually happens. Like, we want to share these stupid ideas at times. And the reason is that sometimes your stupid idea will form somebody else's well-formed idea. It will spark that creative creativity. And so, stupid ideas to me are actually worth mentioning. Now, you can make an acknowledgement that you know it probably doesn't work. I like to actually just say stupid idea incoming, and then I just spout out whatever idiocy is coming out of my mouth. Um, substitute whatever phrase you want to alert your teammates that you know what you're saying is ridiculous or has issues, but you still want to spit it out. And then 99% of the time, you're going to move on, you're not going to talk about it anymore, you're not going to chuckle, and then it doesn't do anything. But occasionally, somebody else might build off that idea and come up with what becomes a cool idea that you have. So don't be scared to shout out your stupid ideas. Also, remember, don't spend too much time talking. Every minute you're talking is a minute that you're not building. And you're going to learn and iterate and change so much more once you actually start building. Uh, you'll learn more by actually trying to create the game. So start building the game as soon as you possibly can. Start with the core mechanic, because that is going to be the core interaction players you're going to have with the game. If your core mechanic isn't solid, the game is going to be in trouble. Don't just work on your core mechanic for the entire time, however. Set a mini goal. See, you're basically going through an entire dev cycle here in 48 hours. So break up that time into different chunks. Give yourself a small amount of time to have your first group prototype and core, core mechanics together. Yes, give yourself these deadlines. Then play test what you have, see what you have. Discuss it with your, uh, the rest of your group mates if you're working in a group. What works? What doesn't? What are your ideas for how to fix this? Adjust. Like, why make these mini deadlines? Because you will fail. And then you will fail again. And most of you are going to fail a third time, and again, and again. And every failure is an opportunity for you to react, readjust, and reprioritize. I encourage your failures as much as possible. Fail early, fail often, and then fail again. And every time you force yourself to do so, you're forcing yourself, or every time you force a deadline, excuse me, you're forcing yourself to look at your failures. And not just tell yourself, oh, it'll be okay, we'll figure it out later. It'll, it'll work at the end, I swear. Like, you actually have to look your failure in the eye and address it in some manner. You have, if you have teammates, you're forcing them to answer their questions and their concerns. And you're going to force yourself to adjust and react. This is important. This is where the quality is going to come from. This is what we call iteration. Iteration is the byproduct of failure. Failure for, for, forces us to iterate as designers. And so it's going to force you. So embrace the failure. The faster and more often you fail, the faster you will find that magical core of the game that matters. So while you're working on your core mechanic, also do not neglect the aesthetic of the game. That's the audios and the visuals that will uh, complement the game. Don't think that your awesome gameplay is a, in an ugly form is enough to wound judges. It may be good enough to you to understand what you're trying to do and understand if your idea works or not, but it might not be enough for other people. Make sure that you're on track with the art and sound, and then it matches whatever adjustments you're making to the gameplay. Don't ever sit, however, and wait for art and sound, right? Prototype and fail with a temporary program art, not final art, that's a lot of wasted work, potentially. You can start too early on art and sound, but you can also start too late. Or, you know, you can just make a game that sound only has no art, and then you don't have to worry about art. Um, now, at some point during this series of mini-deadlines, you're probably going to play the game with your teammates, you're going to see some good things, and then you're going to realize you can't finish your time. Welcome to game development! <laughs> it's time to take the scalpel out and do what I like to call game design scope surgery. Uh, so, did you have plan on having five levels originally? You'd have a two. 
Uh, if you plan to have like a fully customized character and stats, well, let's go ahead and cut that and make like three default characters that players can choose from. Um, in order to cut scope, you have to know what your priorities are for your game. These priorities should evolve from what your initial goals were. What's the most important thing to finishing your game? Remember, it's better to have something small and good than something broad and average. It's possible that you're going to find yourself in a situation where one team member is just completely overloaded or a bottleneck. So figure out ways to uh, remove that impediment. You could have other people help them out, or you could reduce, reduce the load to reduce the load on them. You could have uh, other teams like lend new people, so you could just try to like hammer it out if they're kind of ahead of schedule. Uh, or maybe you know, like bribe them with dog treats. Like dog treats or gave are his best friends. Uh, other ways to speed up development is remember that games are smoke and mirrors. Sometimes, and especially in prototyping code, it's okay to take shortcuts and do things quick and dirty. If they approach a level of quality that like you need, like that's good enough. You don't need to do things the proper way. You're not going to get a reward for that. Getting things done on time is of the utmost uh, importance. For those of you who are programmers, especially those of you who learn from like professors, they like, don't worry if you're doing things that violate good standards of coding practices, especially if you're the only one touching the code. Like if this game ever became a real game, you're going to scrap this all and rebuild it anyway. So it really doesn't matter. Here's an example of how to take smart shortcuts. <laughs> a few years ago, I was working on a game, uh, a three-month prototype for what became Singularity. Uh, we were a team of 10, and we were working pretty hard to pitch this new IP to Activision, get the game funded, and start working on it. And with about a day or two to go before the pitch meeting, uh, I, I was informed that there was a problem with the game. I was a programmer at the time. Basically, as soon as you loaded into the game, you would hear all these objects in the world settle and crash to the ground and play in their associated sounds. It literally sounded like a thousand trash cans and crates hitting the ground at once because it literally was a thousand trash cans and crates hitting the ground at once. <laughs> Basically, everything in our game would like spawn a couple centimeters off the ground and then like when the, when the physics engine was initialized, would settle and the sound system would go like, oh, a collision event was triggered and we would play a sound. Like we have that system, so like if I throw a barrel over a railing, it hits the ground, the sound plays, it sounds normal. So the problem was pretty basic, right? The threshold for making objects hit the ground was too low. It was tripping up too easily. So an hour after being told that this bug needed to be fixed critically, I had to fix it, and I let the people in charge know that, hey, I fixed the problem. And they asked that I fixed the problem with the threshold, and like I told them, no, no, I did not at all. Like, why didn't you do what we told you to do? And I said, I want to create an issue where we're making more problems in the game, there are, where sounds are not playing where they should be now. So how did I fix the problem? I just muted the game for the first five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> like, as soon as the game loaded up, I said mute, and then I posted an event for five seconds later, it said unmute, and it worked perfectly, right? Like, nobody noticed. In fact, we were talking about the game. Like, that fix took me five minutes to do, and most of that was finding where in the code to do it, and then loading the game, which took forever to load and making sure it worked. Like, it was simple. The, the proper way to do it, fixing the actual threshold, took me hours of work. I would have had to test, and like, to not just test that one area, test the whole game now, make sure everything worked, right? That would have been a crazy amount of work, and I probably would have broken things, and I'm not a very good programmer, uh, fast. But we didn't need to do that. It was just a prototype. This was just a demo to Activision. Like this was just to get the game green. But like I would never release a game to players for real and take a shortcut like that. Well, a prototype for like publishing executives? Fuck yeah. <laughs> so remember, like take shortcuts and use smoke and mirrors to your advantage. Right? Players don't need to know what's happening behind the scenes. Just, just screw it. Like, like screw with them. Um, what I mean is no perception, I don't want to <laughs> Why not? Uh, and I'll help you with the fastest you can. Uh, now, if things are going right, you're know, regularly play testing the game, you're setting these many deadlines and using that as an excuse to look at everything in your game every hour or so, even more frequently than every hour or so, hopefully, if you can. You're probably cutting scope as you go, right? You're improving on your ideas. You're maybe even coming up with new ideas that are better than your original ideas and incorporating them or you know, adjusting your plan as you go. Um, and that's awesome, right? that's good. You've got to be agile and nimble. But, but while you're doing this, just keep play testing and play testing and play testing your game. Like, 
if you see someone from another group just standing around or taking a break, like ask them to come over and check, like play your game. Do an exchange program where like you play somebody else's group's games and they play yours like for a few minutes and give each other feedback. Do this a number of times, not just once. Uh, roll that feedback into your plan. You have to be able to react. If, if you when you play test, you can figure out how many how to do things before like. You can let the player figure out how to do things before you tell them all the secrets of the game. You can figure out, like, does your game naturally just work, or do you have to explain all the controls, all the intricacies? Remember, and especially in a game jam setting, like that first 30 seconds that you have in the game is so absolutely important. And so you want to see how is the player reacting to the first 30 seconds. Are they even hitting the emotional targets that you kind of set at the beginning of the game, right? Um, so this feedback you get from playtesting is so absolutely vitally important. One final topic to discuss when working on a game jam is rest. So in 48 hours, there's a tendency to think that you just need to stay up the whole time, drink as much caffeine as possible, and never, never, never stop. Uh, but this is pretty much counterproductive unless you're superhuman. Most of us need rest. Most of our brains need to, like, a break and to think about something else uh, or even sleep. I would highly recommend that you plan some amount of rest and sleep into your schedules this weekend. I can promise you, you will make a lot less errors and you will be a lot more efficient on day two if you successfully plan some sleep into day one. It could just be four hours, but schedule some amount of time. <coughs> Excuse me. Listen to your body, and especially when it's telling you when it's time to stop or take a break. Uh, this isn't, and, and it's also one of the things that I, I'd like to tell you to do for the good of every single person in this room. Please bathe. Please. <laughs> it's gonna smell really bad if you don't. This might not make your game any better, but literally like, all your game jammers are going to be much more appreciative if you do some amount of hygiene. Um, beyond sleep, take breaks. You know, eat dinner, talk as a group, get up, walk around, change your surroundings, even for, even for 15 minutes. That can just help you refocus and, and get some of your energy back. Um, watch out for caffeine too, actually. Overdoing it on caffeine can give you the jitters. Uh, I've seen people at work, like, hands are shaking like they're an alcoholic, basically, because they drink too many cups of coffee. Uh, usually, you make bad or snap decisions, or you lose your temper sometimes when you kind of all antsy the pants even to this caffeine. So don't forget about decent nutrition and rest. I promise that these things will help you. Like, don't try to Iron Man the event. No one's going to give you a high five for not sleeping in 48 hours or turning out a mediocre game. Um, if you remember to do these things that I mentioned, then you got a good chance at success. Uh, at least you're setting yourself up with some of the best possible circumstances. But for some of you, that's not going to be enough. For some teams, you're going to realize eventually that your idea and game is completely broken. It's unworkable, and you need to come up with something, anything, to salvage it and finish. The reasons for this are numerous. There's too difficult of an idea to finish with the time allotted. Uh, you understand and estimate how much manpower or skill it might take to do. The inability to make that core idea interesting, that like in actuality uh, cripples the core mechanic of the game. Or it's just a bad idea. Um, it doesn't really matter how this happened. What do you do when you are screwed? Well, here's what you don't do. You don't give up. Games are all about, game development is all about adversity. In the development community, some of the greatest games of all time, some of your favorites, have been pulled out of the ashes of something going horribly awry. Like, many games go into a very bad place during development. The good teams are the ones that are able to identify that and react and pull the game out of that bad place and then elevate it to something special. So first, identify what went wrong quickly. What, like, this doesn't mean blame each other and blame, like, point fingers and, like, it was your fault. What, what I mean is, we all did this together as a team. You need to just fix that problem and figure out what it is. If the problem is a core idea, do you have a new idea or a secondary idea that you came up with earlier that you like? Uh, do you have something that you can do fast and dirty? Is there a way that you can repurpose the current things that you have into an interesting design? The point is to be smart. You can only have a few hours to go when you sometimes when you realize that you're, you're completely fucked. So maybe you have to make something really basic. Maybe you have some awesome art and you have like no real gameplay to it and you can cobble something together that resembles a game that's really like got lots of art on it. We've all played games that have come out like that. It's not optimal, I completely agree, but the point is you're trying to learn from finishing and learning from that failure is actually going to be really valuable. And learning how to adjust from that failure to 
last second is something that, that is worthwhile. Uh, if you're really in doubt, uh, I suggest making something very abstract and arty. Give it a one more title like loneliness or serendipity. Um, when the judges explain to you that, like, like myself, you're saying, I have no idea what that game's about, just tell them they don't get art games and they storm off. Like, guaranteed to work. Like I said, the value of a game jam is the experience of finishing. No matter what that path is that you take to get. Because the path is full of lessons, good and bad. And that's going to help you down the road um, much more in game development, whether you're a hobbyist or professional, by having those lessons. So do whatever you can to finish from hell or high level. The wonderful thing about these things, as I mentioned, is that they really apply to the professional games industry, from big budget games to smaller, you know, one million dollar games, or even like mobile games. What you work on, like what you work on, doesn't matter. This, these lessons are absolutely going to apply. You need to be able to prototype rapidly. You need to be able to embrace your failures. You need to be able to handle scope. Scope is the number one thing, by the way, that kills games that I see beyond like just like coming up with silly ideas. Like scope, feature creep, worst thing. And play testing, like, knowing what your game plays like, is so vitally important. But there's something else that's also fairly important. While well, you don't have to have the most perfect idea in the world, you probably want something about it to be unique. You don't want the exact same idea as someone else, but just with different levels. If you're making a 2D platformer, what twist are you giving it? If you're, you can't, it can be a small twist, but even small twists can be unique. Or it can be a game-changing like twist. Like a whole new mechanic that no one's ever tried in the world. But if you just try to make a game that's like Super Mario Brothers and copies all the mechanics of Super Mario Brothers and just has different levels, like, what, why are you doing that? What redeeming qualities does that really happen? Because we see this problem all the time, right, in our games industry. And usually, the, the, like, someone makes a stellar game, and then everybody else just goes and just tries to copy that formula to capitalize on that stellar game. Uh, but the ones that just try to copy, copy that formula are the games that usually end up being mediocre. Because they're not adding anything new, they're missing that core, that soul. The winners are the ones who take risks. <laughs> Calculated, small risks, but risks. Making a first-person shooter for a console that doesn't have a huge online presence yet was a giant risk in 2001. But Bungie did it with Halo, and look at how that changed the industry. The leaders of this industry consistently do something new in some way. It could be technically new, like online capabilities, or rendering technology, like when we got 3D acceleration in GL Quake back in the day. It could be some new design or genre or an interesting blend of genres like what Deus Ex has done. Uh, it could be polished design that is known, but with a new emotional target that has never been seen in a game. Like the cinematic war experience of Call of Duty. But the leaders of this industry almost always push in some way. But most of our industry doesn't do that. We're an industry of copycats. We're an industry of wannabes. We want to mitigate risk. So if we figure we copy someone else's formula, all the risk is gone, because the formula sounds. But the risk is that we can't actually replicate the results. Usually, we can't. And really, should we? Like, should we be just trying to copy others? Even if we do succeed, what then? Like, what, what, what have we done? What, what good does it mean to you? What are we doing for the industry or society as a whole by just making another, like, 2D platformer that looks the same? What hole is that filling? Why are we wasting time, our good, valuable time on this earth, making a game that isn't trying to push something new and interesting? To make a quick dollar? Like, there's more to this world and industry than profits. Let the business people worry about money, but to us, the creators, the people like you and me in this room, we should answer to something more, like, bigger and more grand than the almighty dollar or kroner in your case. Instead of making something that we people make a lot of money, or something that is safe, instead of copying another design in full and moving it to a different platform, I issue a challenge to all of you in this room, all developers in the world, including myself. I issue a challenge to take more risks, even if they're small risks, to call to push the medium in new and interesting ways. A call not to just fall back on what is known and what is safe. Our industry requires innovation. Our industry demands and thrives on new thinking, new ideas, and new pushes. But business people, they don't. They just demand money. And we listen to them way too often, and we make uninteresting copycat games because we think it's going to generate a lot of money. And that's a load of bullshit. 
Any creator in this room shouldn't make games because it will make you a lot of money. You should make games because you want to make games. You should make games because you want to push the medium, not because it's going to get you rich. If you do this, you have a much better chance of making something magical, of making something beautiful, and ultimately successful. And then guess what? You can figure out how to make money off of that game. There's no shame in making money off of a game. There's no shame in starting a business and being profitable. But money can't be what drives our primary focus for creating the game. It can't be the reason behind the game. If we do that, we lose the soul of what makes our games great. We become a legion of copycats. We stagnate as an industry. It has to come from the need to excel and push ourselves. So let's not be satisfied with the way things are. Let's not accept the status quo. Let's push each other to new heights. And it starts right here with this game jam. Game jams are integral to that risky, innovative, experimental way of thinking. It's the way we do shadow physics games. It's the way we come up with the next indie darling like World of Goo. It's the way that we express ourselves safely without any worry that we're gonna to be too attached to our ideas or it's gonna to cost too much time and money. You right here have the ability to get this industry back on track with your games, with your ability to just work on things fast. Your game has the ability to spawn someone else's great full-fledged game or your own full-fledged game. Years from now, you might be working on a game when you hate your boss and you know he's telling you that you need to monetize the fuzzy bears for the average user so your dollars go up and blah, 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 shoot um, me. And instead of wanting to kill yourself, uh, remember the game jam, this game jam. Remember how it felt to be experimenting and trying something different and new and innovative and trying it because it was an interesting idea, not just because it was the money or the job behind it. Never lose sight of that. Don't be scared to do your own game jams in your time with your group of friends, like my friend Scott here did. Don't be scared to find a company that finds a way to be profitable while being innovative and having a soul. Never accept that copying others is the way to do things. Embrace failure. Never back down from it. Remember that innovation, experimentation, and risk are the core of what we do as creatives. And never forget that that is what you are. You are a creative. You are gaming, and you are capable of making something beautiful, magical, captivating, and moving. And that is how our industry will not only survive, but thrive. And I, for one, absolutely cannot wait to see what you all come up with in the next 48 hours. Thank you.